It was a day no different than today. Or maybe it was. It's hard to tell. Was something created or just improved enough to tip the scales? The designs conceived mid-year of 1951 stood the test of time. The tones produced have skewed our collective ears, deliberately or not, changing the timbre of popular music. I imagine they set out to solve a problem and solve it elegantly, and that they did. So today, 69 years later, let's talk about the beginnings of the electric bass. And while this is not a precision bass, its form and function solve the same problem Leo and George set out to resolve back in 51. The P bass was by no means the first electric bass. The concept had popped up several times as far back as 1930. To say that they envisioned all that would come of this method to transfer sound from string energy to electrical energy, manipulate and amplify it, would go much too far. What do these two fellows do differently? Or was it just the right time? I feel like there was an energy at that moment. Yes, not an original idea, but inspiration nonetheless. The object that is art and makes art at the same time also feeds this energy back into its design. It serves the same purpose as its patriarchal slab. It is somehow imbibed with this creativity and must take forms like this one. The tones produced inspire us to feed back, no pun intended, this energy back into the device's creative design. In these fast moving 69 years and counting, many forms have come and gone. The electric bass continues to develop and change designs and styles rapidly and continually in a much more concise way than its six-string bunk mates. It accepts change and does so in rapid succession. Now, lugging a cumbersome, unwieldy, and not to mention fragile double bass to gigs had gone the way of the dodo, or had it. Without amplification, when the volume got too loud, the basses stayed thin or wore blisters into his paw. With amplification, and this is important, an instrument resistant to feedback, i.e. a slab or a hunk of solid wood, the tone and pure mass of sound made possible transitioned the music of the day. You could feel the difference. Any double basis Working with a sound man that has never worked with an acoustic bass knows this struggle. We expect this wave of low frequencies, not just the sound we hear, but also feel. The tone is so intrinsically different between the instruments. And I'm not trying to say that one is better than the other. What I'm trying to say is the electric bass is a complex creature, just like its acoustic brethren. They each in their own right have to be coddled and pampered to produce the intended result. When we sit in a living room listening to our friends and relatives play acoustically, we expect a rich array of string overtones and harmonics. In the concert hall and theater, we require waves of low rumbles. We anticipate the feel of these tones. When we look at bases like this one, we have to pay tribute to bold luthiers that paved the way. While this is not a neck through design, many of the new bass body styles that continue to adapt over time owe a debt to yet another luthier. Yeah, Leo and the boys did kick this whole thing off back in 51 and continued the tradition of adaptation into the 1960s with first the precision bass and later the jazz bass.
we wouldn't be anywhere without George and Leo. But this guy, and I'm talking about Carl Thompson, is the bass luthier that opens our eyes and turns our heads. Designs like this one come directly from his sphere of influence. I think like most of us, it was Les Claypool that introduced us to these instruments. These designs are a perfect paradigm of the music he strums and thumps out of them. This freedom of form present in both the design and tone make for the perfect pair. It comes as no surprise to me that along with these beautiful forms, Carl spent a great deal of time perfecting instruments for the hands and ears of musicians who play them. Why is it that the bass as a form is so welcome to change, both in form and function? I find it interesting. Bassists accept these changes and in fact, welcome them. There's a stunning variety of bass luthiers out there today, designing and making dynamic instruments. I enjoy this innovation and I'm pleased to participate in this process, but I'm a bassist, so it comes naturally to me. Carl sharpened his craft at Dan Armstrong's shop in New York City, and later in 1970, he set out on his own. Carl filled in on bass one night and discovered issues with balance and playability in the instruments of the time. From there, just as we saw with Leo Fender and the like, Carl begins to adapt and manipulate the form until he comes up with something that's truly exceptional. currently in a run of basses, and I couldn't be happier. I really enjoy making basses, and I look forward to the next design that comes through the old email. Thanks for watching.